order the meeting of January, no, January, geez, June 20th, 2018, select board meeting. Um, open this with a consent agenda. And we have warrants of AP 1848, AP 1849, AO 1495, PR 1849, and PR 1850. Minutes of April 11th and April 18th. We have a live entertainment license, Happy Valley Comedy & Company, Mark Braidman GM contingent upon final inspe inspection and testing of all life safety devices uh, per fire chief. Hadley Media Advisory Board, uh, Kathy Saturka, resignation. Uh, West APR, the select board is asked to sign the West APR agreement, award contract for accounting services to Bay State Municipal Accounting, Senior Center Design Amendment, revote on amended language. Uh, special <coughs> town meeting warrant, the select board is asked to open the warrant for the fall town meeting. Uh, for October 18th, 2018. Uh, 2018 budget transfers, multiple departments, and surplus property uh, below $500 fire department. $140,000. Oh, wait, we don't want to forget that one. I don't have that on there. Yeah, I just had a question on that one. Sure. It should be right above the. Uh, um, Oh, the select board is asked to sign the agreement between the town, five colleges, and PBTA. Yep. Is there a motion? I just, I just had a question on we the PBTA. Could, could we do the I have, could make a motion for the rest of the consent agenda. We could do the whole thing with contingent if you want to. With you contingent. I just have one question on the PBTA. Okay. I'll take a first and second and then questions. Can you just make a motion? Yeah, I can make a motion to pass the consent agenda. Uh, I'll second for further discussion. Okay, thank you. My okay. question right there on the PVTA was just, it was unclear to me if we were paying anything or if that was getting paid or if there was any yeah, so contribution the, we were making. Long before I came to the town of Hadley, somebody, I would like to shake their hands, whoever it was, uh, set up an agreement between five colleges incorporated and the town of Hadley where we get payments for ridership of the buses up and down Route 9 and Bay Road. Um, most towns have to pay an assessment as do we, but they don't get the money from the consortium whereas we do. Last year we received $145,000 in change for this. So. This is an agreement between the town and five colleges <coughs> to promote uh, public transportation in the valley and ease our congestion. Uh, it's unusual. Not many towns in the Commonwealth have this kind of agreement. But some, some wise person put it together 15, 16 years ago. But we have to renew it every couple of years. Okay. Uh, in exchange for getting the money, um, we have to promise to support their grant applications. So letters of support from us. And, and in general, that we should support public transportation. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes, sir. Did you need to see what the surplus equipment is? It, it, sure. Sure. Did you have anything other to say also on the um, budget transfer? The budget transfer that you approved last time, yeah, this was last week. Uh, and uh, it was signed by the finance committee last week, and so just putting back to your signature. Thank you very much. And Mike, did you have anything to say on the Happy Valley Comedy and Company that was per you that there would be a um, approval for the license? It just needs, a, needs to be a final life safety inspection. Okay. With the building inspector. It needs to be done. Okay. Not by you. By myself and, and the building inspector. Okay. So we can do it for changing time. Oh, Joyce, there's a hand raised. Yes, Jane. Jane. On the uh, contract for designer services, there's an error on the second line. For the town of Hadley, not South Hadley. 
that was in there's one where it is that and there's one where they're well they're that. also doing south Hadley, so i can okay. understand but i think we ought to have it clean on us yeah yeah, the, it's a contract. Copy, the copy yeah. that's ready for signature tonight is a clean, it's a clean copy. copy. Okay, yeah. I noticed the PDF had it and the doc it did it. Yeah. yeah, correct. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. All right. Is it all in favor? All in favor? Aye. 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 Except for the fire department. Except for the fire department. <coughs> okay. Aye. And Thank you. An abstention. Is that what you mean? Yeah. 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 Abstention. Okay. Public comments. <coughs> um, I believe we have two reps here for the Second Hampshire District, and Dan Carey. Would you like to introduce yourself tonight? Absolutely. Go ahead. Uh, good, good evening. Sorry, <laughs> my name is Dan Carey. And as you heard, I'm running for state representative for the Second Hampshire District for John Cybeck seat, who will be retiring, as you know. I just wanted to take a minute to introduce myself and thanks to Joy, Joyce for the invitation to come tonight. Um, my name is Dan Carey, I'm from East Hampton. I'm a lifelong resident of the area. I graduated from East Hampton High School in 2003. Graduated from Emanuel College in Boston for my BA and I got my JD from Western New England University School of Law. I am, as of this week, an assistant district attorney at the Northwestern District Attorney's Office. The last couple years I worked for the district attorney running his drug diversion and treatment program. And I don't want to take up a lot of time and give you, you know, get into all the issues tonight. We'll have plenty of time over the course of the summer to have those conversations, but I wanted to be able to, for you to be able to have a face to the name, and I hope we have a lot of those conversations throughout the summer. Um, I, state representative position is such an important position. I know from my time on the East Ham School Committee, I was elected in 2013 when I was 29, on my 29th birthday, to the East Ham School Committee. I served a full term there, and then I ran for East Ham City Council in 2015 and was recently re-elected to my second term there, where I serve on the Finance Committee and I chair the Public Safety Committee for the uh, East Hampton City Council. And so I know how important the state rep position is and what a great job John has done, working for all four of the towns and being an advocate for us when we need him to, and we need somebody who can get in there and continue that. Uh, my grandfather held this same step rep, state rep seat uh, back in the 70s and 80s, which is, not any reason for anyone to vote for me, but is an inspiration for me and a motivation for me to make sure that this area continues to be well represented. And so, again, I just want to thank you for the time, and I'm sure we'll have some more time to chat uh, with you folks and with everybody in Hadley. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks for coming. Uh, we also have John Hines from yes. South Hadley. John Hines from South Hadley. Good evening. And, uh, like Dan, I'm also running for state representative. Um, this is all familiar to me. I was a select board member in South Hadley for 12 years. Um, on the planning board for four years, so uh, I know all about this affordable housing issue uh, that all of our towns face. Uh, on the school committee before that, so um, I've been involved in municipal government for a very long time. Um, professionally, I've been in the information technology field, working at Mass Mutual, Polio Medical Center, and for the past 20 years at Bay State Health, I think working at Bay State and Holyoke have given me real good insight into health care and the issues that uh, we face in terms of rising health care costs and providing quality care. Um, so it's an, as Dan says, an opportunity it's for you to see a face associated with a name. Uh, I look forward to talking with you hopefully individually to learn more about Abby and what the issues uh, has in face. So um, thank you for allowing me to speak tonight and I look forward to seeing everybody a little bit more. Thank you. Yeah. We look forward to having more conversations with both of you, and good luck to both of you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. We have David Rotana, and he is a soon-to-be senior at Hopkins Academy. He is now our um, intern in the select board office, and he's very enthusiastic to help us with David with. Uh, many projects that he's going to be getting over the summer. So welcome, uh, David, and jump on board. Do you have anything you'd like to say? Yeah. Uh, I would like to express once again my immense gratitude to um, any of the members of the select board that uh, that allowed me this 
this opportunity it is, of course, an incredible opportunity, and I'm very excited to, um, to help out around here and learn whatever there is to learn about, um, about the government issues and the proceedings that, uh, that need to occur on a daily basis. I, uh, I really am excited, and uh, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. We're glad to have uh, somebody young in our community that's willing to take an interest at your age, so thank you. And I've been impressed by Mr. Rotano's uh, dedication to his career. He's very clear about what he would like to do as an adult, and he sees the work for the town of Hadley is fitting very nicely into the background and training that he'll need in order to be successful in future life. Mr. Rotano is going to be with us uh, starting Monday for 40 hours per week. He'll get a bit of time off for other things that he has to do during the summer and he'll be here through August. So we have him for about two months and we'll make good use of him. I'm going to ha ask him to help me update the service delivery plan, which I think fits very well into what he's interested in. Great. Thank you. Any other public comments? We have about five more minutes. All right, well then we'll jump right into the next thing, because we have a full agenda this evening. Um, do you want to do your report next? Uh, why don't you want to do a quick... Why don't we do, I'll do a quick report, uh, so long as you sign this uh, <laughs> West APR. Okay. And we have no public here who's waiting to go home. Oh, thank <laughs> you, Linda. <laughs> Anywhere up here? Yeah. Uh, so my weekly report, uh, we've been focusing on almost exclusively on uh, getting the ambulance service up uh, and running. Uh, we still are on target for the switchover for Friday, June 29th at 7 o'clock with noon, excuse me, noon, with a backup date of uh, July 2nd uh, if we uh, aren't able to make everything work. Uh, it's an enormous amount of work that we're doing. Uh, representatives of Action EMS are here. Members of the ambulance uh, work group are here. The chief spank table is here. Chief Mason has been working on this as well as his staff. There's been a lot of uh, uh, a lot of preparation. A lot of things that I've learned about ambulance service. In other news, we see that the pedestrian crossing improvements on Route 9 are going up and it should be operational soon. They have the hardware which they were waiting for. Uh, Marlow is working on the flat grant from the Bridge Road. Uh, we have a vote tomorrow at noon to 8 p.m. at Hopkins Academy for the additional funding for the design for the fire substation. $855,400 encourage people to vote. Uh, senior center update, we had a meeting with the uh, planning board last night and that meeting has been continued to July 17th. Um, we will be advertising construction documents when ready, when the planning board site plan review is completed. Uh, so Turka Park, uh, we finally got the uh, uh, bond documents back, so final signatures on the contract are being collected. We had uh, expected this project to be completed by August 31st, but we're going to have to extend that because of the late start. Uh, the IT grant for the uh, SCADA system for the seven sewer pump stations, that project is substantially complete now. We'll be making our final reports to the state for that generous contribution. Uh, the final report on the geotechnical survey of the dike is completed. Uh, we're going to be uh, giving a, we'll be given a presentation on August 1st. Special town meeting, you've all taken your vote to update, talked about the ambulance. OSHA is still there, we're getting training for that. Focusing in on the capital plan, a 10-year capital plan is being reviewed, updated, and expanded. Deadline for submission is this Friday, June 22nd, and we'll have the first meeting on July 9th. Um, let's see, the final report of the uh, Pioneer of the um, Community Preservation Act Committee, as written by the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, has been submitted and uh, there were meetings on 
June 11th and June 18th to bring that into a landing. Uh, let's see what else. FY18 audit, we've opened up the portal for Merlance and Heath, so now key departments can, may upload their financial information for FY 2018 when those are ready. <coughs> and uh, we're making progress on union contract negotiations. We have a vote tomorrow, June 21st. <coughs> And uh, there are community <coughs> events coming up. Just look at the signs that are outside. Okay, thank you. Got one question, please. Certainly. Um, have we been paid for the damages to the common and the dike yet and the repair sign? Well, I haven't got the payment for the dike. The common, did we get the money for that yet? Yeah, we're all set on the common. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Do you know where we stand on that form of the dike? Is that the um, No. No, uh, I'll have to follow up on that. Mm -hmm. Geez, there hasn't been anything else on his schedule lately. I know, yeah. Have to be light on it. Um, all right. So next on the agenda will be affordable housing. Um, we'll hear a presentation by the planning board, and we will take it under advisement um, for this evening, and then um, make a commitment to what we're going to do at our next meeting. All right. Okay. Well, with the email that I sent you, that the we thought uh, we have roughly just under 14 percent affordable housing in town of Hadley, and we thought we were good for 60 years. 60, 60 years. We found out when the Plain Valley Planning Commission uh, met with us about two months ago that that's not the case. In five years, 2023. There will be uh, 25 units coming off the inventory, and in 2032, there will be 80 more coming off. 25 units coming off in 2023 will bring us to, I don't know, like, it'll still be above 10%, but the 80 units coming off will drop us well below the 10%. And, uh, I'm sorry, Jim, what year was the, the 20, 2023, 25 units come off, yep. and in 2032, 80 units come off. Okay. And That's the same email you sent us a couple of weeks ago. Pardon? That's the same email you sent us a couple of weeks ago. Yes, and but this this is this inventory you should have in your email because we got it from PBTC and Bill distributed it to your these, secretary. These are the specific numbers. Right. Oh, okay. these, the other was right. more just a warning of yeah. right. And you know, we're aware we were alerted to this. It, I mean the planning board has no authority to do the negotiation to extend this. Other towns have been to the same um, situation and they've been able to extend for the contracts or you know whatever may have been done with some developers either fully par partially fully or sometimes some cases they weren't successful at all however that's up to the board of selectmen to negotiate i mentioned to one of the members of the board of selectmen a couple of ideas on possibly on mountain view apartments um and on winfield estates no i'm not sure so could i backtrack just a little bit we're using this number 10 percent throwing it around there's a, a very specific reason in massachusetts if your inventory of affordable housing and that is affordable housing on the state inventory is less than 10 percent you are exposed to a chapter 40b comprehensive permit application and on a comprehensive permit application, right now, Mass uh, Hadley is uh, zoned for one dwelling per lot, single family homes only. Uh, comprehensive permit can override zoning, and you can get a large apartment house, apartment building in, such as uh, the Winfield family apartments, family estates. And I don't know how many total units are there. Uh, we're getting, or they're getting credit for 80 units. We're getting credit for 80 units, but I don't want to call 40B a scam, but there is a very juicy incentive to a developer that you only have to dedicate 25 to 30 percent of the of the units in the 20 to 25 of the units in the development to affordability. Then you can have the other. 75 to 80 percent market rate 
So, uh, and they all count. And they, but they all count because they came in under the umbrella of the um, of the comprehensive permit. <coughs> Once you are above the 10 percent, or again, if you're below the 10 percent threshold, unless you have a really compelling reason, uh, the state board that hears appeals from 40B almost invariably finds in favor of the developer if the community is below the 10 percent threshold. Unless it's something truly compelling like we're all rock and there's no place to put a septic system. So uh, that's why we can't support this number of housing. Um, once you are above the 10 percent, you are um, pretty much exempt from an unfriendly or hostile 40B. You can still agree to a friendly 40B if someone wanted to come in with, say, 40 units of dedicated affordable senior housing. Uh, you might want to go along with it and say, sure, you know, we'll, we'll look at that. But uh, to have the ability to make a judgment about how you want to go, you have to be above the 10%. And that's why the 10% is a magic number. And the 13% is, uh, you know, it really puts us in a very elite group. Some communities, say Holyoke, uh, Springfield, have substantial numbers. They're maybe 20, 30%. Uh, but as a general rule, most communities, most non gateway communities, do not have. Uh, much affordable housing, and you're pretty much subject to the whim of a developer. Uh, even if you remember in Sunderland, uh, Sunderland has a lot of housing units, a lot of apartment units that are on a dollar basis considered affordable, but virtually none of them are um, deed restricted, so they are not on the inventory which was why a developer was able to come into Sunderland and propose a 40B project, even though Sunderland had no shortage of housing that was actually affordable. So anyway, that's the background as to why we thought it was a good thing that you would know about this. When, when, when the uh, PDPC came in about two months ago, I talked about this, and I said, well, 2032, that, that's, you know, that's 15 years out. That's a long time, and they said, when you have to negotiate these uh, revised leases, if you would, or, or agreements, they says five years is no time, because sometimes you can get to get that. Depending on, obviously, what negotiations go on, but if you get the state involved, sometimes that, that negotiation with the state could take six years or seven, seven years by itself. But this is not something that we should be waiting on. We're alerting you to, alerting you to the facts so that we're not caught behind the eight ball and um, Maybe we can do something to at least retain part of these, but not all of them. So what is the purview of the board that, um, what does the select board have to do? They basically have to take the bull by the horn and do it all because the planning board, I mean, if you want the planning board to help you, we can, but we have no negotiating authority with the boards. Um, you know, Mountain View Apartments has a problem that you're aware of. Um, Winfield Family Estates, the person that I don't I call him the owner or the major developer, came in to see us about two months ago. Is it Robinson he, still? He was a tall, older man. I don't know what his name was. I, I don't remember what his name was. Robinson. Um, yeah. Very yeah. Years ago. Kind of, you know, big guy. Uh, anyways, he, would, he asked if he could put in, I think he wanted to put in 40 more units of senior housing. And we told him that, you know, you're not, basically the senior housing zone that is allowed by with a special permit from the bridge to the bike path. But if you were to, you know, come in with, come to it, come into us with a plan, you would have to put in some, some more affordable as part of that. Well, I already have this many affordable, yeah, but this is going to be additional. Um, then uh, you'd probably need, a, the easiest way, which you told them probably if you wanted to do that, instead of going to town meeting for zone change, just go to the ZBA for variance. And depending on the plan, you know, the planning board may or may not support that. So there is, 
there's something, there's possibly something going on there that we may be able to get a little bit out of. It. I don't know, but I just, just those are two projects, and that's all that we're aware of that could be done with anything. Have they come so, back in again? He hasn't come back to us. We haven't heard a word since that, just, one, that one time. Just a walking inquiry. So if you've been following our meetings, you know we've spent a lot of time with our Pioneer Valley Planning Commission consultants talking about affordable housing and. We do have an inclusionary zoning bylaw which says that a developer that wants to put up more than 10 lots has to provide a proportion of those as affordable units, either on site or elsewhere in town. Uh, we also have an inclusionary or affordability component of the senior housing, which unfortunately proved to be un somewhat unworkable in practice. Uh, so we're trying to keep ahead of the curve as new people come in, but our best efforts can't keep up with taking a hit of 100 units. Um, and we also have been talking about an affordable housing trust fund, which is another option uh, to which developers could contribute funds that we could in turn use to leverage. We don't have a consensus on the board as to whether that is a good idea or not. Uh, but we, we're working on it, but neither of those resources, the inclusionary zoning, uh, the affordable housing trust fund, don't actually have, uh, don't give us any better standing to talk with a property owner who might be coming off inventory. You may remember there has been, there was some of this in Amherst and the town administrator negotiated with the property owner and state agencies, contributed money, they put together a complex financing package and they were able to preserve in perpetuity units that would otherwise have been rolling off the inventory. Uh, I only know what I followed from the newspaper on that, but it can be done, but it takes, as Jim said, it, it takes a while. Years ago, just a little bit of history on the whole affordable, for the longest time, up to probably about, well, but this is 2032, probably uh, maybe, I don't know when the senior estates came in, but a lot of uh, affordable housing had a 20 year limit. At the end of 20 years, or 25 years, the developer could turn them into market rate and they come off of the inventory. Mm -hmm. That is no longer the case. If somebody puts in affordable housing now under the state mandate, it's in perpetuity. But there is a whole bunch of inventory and have the have luckily has a little bit of but some towns like Amherst faced after half of their affordable units coming off inventory at one point they were able to negotiate, but it's it's a time consuming and it's a tedious task. That was rolling green. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But they had that problem over there. Yeah. Yeah. I would hope that the two candidates for John Seibach's seat pay some attention to this because it is a serious problem. It's one that the state has created for us. There's only three states in the union that have inclusionary <coughs> housing laws. California, New York, and Massachusetts. And it's caused the price of housing to be the highest in the country. So something's not right. The economics of inclusionary housing do not work. And I would hope both of you give a position paper on this subject to let us know where you stand on this problem, which the state created. Okay? How? So these dates were actually pre pre this board, some of this board. Oh, absolutely. <coughs> yeah, the, 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 these dates were basically the expiration date of, of when the units were built. And who negotiated them originally? You know. Well, on Winfield, just a little. I mean, some I would nasty history on Mountain View. Mountain View came into us, that's the one next to Stop and Shop. Yeah. They were going to put in these very nice apartments, subsidized, do this, do this, do this, do this, and they had this grandiose plan. It was a and friendly 40B. <clears throat> it was a friend, friend, so called friendly 40B. I don't 25% into the project. We never heard from them again, and they said, We're not going to comply because we don't have to. We're going to put up what we want. And they did. And that's what we've got today. And they just kind of walked over everything. The Winfield uh, family estates was done, I believe, when, oh, I can't remember the lady's name, she was an attorney who was on this EBA, and that... DeLong. 
Yeah, Joanne Delon. Joanne Delon. Yeah. 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 And, and that, that, that's a good memory. Heidi Allen is on. Never lost it yet. <laughs> and and, 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 and that, that, those hearings took, I want to say they took months. I remember they were having like a one or two meetings a month. And they were just getting information, getting information, getting information. It was a friendly 40, it was an unfriendly 40B, but the ZBA was the one that had some say over the matter, not the planning board. And I remember it was mostly about, not so much the looks, well, a little bit about the, the appearance of the architect. It was more about the whole plan. I don't remember all the details of it, but I remember that, that took, I want to say six months of hearing that they were going on with that. That was a long, drawn-out process. So, but John, specifically to your question, in a 40B, the developer tells you what he's doing. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, there was no negotiation per se, and the ZBA becomes the sole board for the town for everything. So once the developer lined up their financing, made their deal with the state, got certified to proceed under 40B, we had no say in their financing, in how long they were under going to be in the, uh, on the uh, inventory. And, and when these are up, is there any way of renegotiating that housing back, back into the that, Maybe. That, that, that's what we're presenting to you. That, that is what, you know, from what Joyce said, that is what the Rolling Green did, the town of Amherst. Other towns have done similar things. Sometimes they've kept all of it, sometimes they've kept part of it. It's a matter of, you know, how open are they to keeping it and what are the incentives for them to keep it? Can you? Uh, oh, all right. I have one quick thought, kind of like, let's make a deal for the, the select board is in a position to make a deal with uh, Martin View regarding the... No, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. no, 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 that is not part of this discussion, that's a negotiating item, we don't want to talk about it here. We don't want to bring it out in public. Well, I didn't know anybody was negotiating about it. Yeah. We, we, don't want to mention, we, we, don't, we don't want to mention specific items oh, that could well, be so used. This, this is just calling the, the select board's yes. attention to the fact that there is an issue that will need their attention. Yes. So okay. the, la yeah. the last two lines, the uh, DDS group bonds and DMH group bonds, what's the story with those two that have no end date? The last line has zero units. Is those future approved units? Is that what those are? I believe the DDS homes are these homes. There's one. There, there are four in all. Um, and I don't know how they are broken out. Uh, DMH is oh. Department of Mental Health. DDS, uh, I'm not sure what that is. Um, they're um, basically, they're, they're various properties scattered through Hadley. They're the best neighbors you could ever want. Apparently, they're, uh, we, we get perpetual uh, credit. credit and um, you know, no real just for, you know, burden. Just for information, a unit means nothing. It could mean one bedroom. It could mean four bedrooms. Okay. One, one unit doesn't have any particular delineation in this. It just means that there's one unit. But those, so it has uh, the end date of NA, so are those both perpetual? Uh, I think that because they are state programs, okay. we're getting credit for them as units, but if the state decides to, if the contract ends and they decide to put them, put new homes up in Belchertown, then Belchertown gets the credits. Okay. I was surprised to see those on there. I didn't know that we got credit for them. Thank Just you. by way of interest, I'll give this to, to you, the select board, but it uh, has a list of the percentages of the various community. Sutherland was brought up. They are under 1%, and they were supposed to have that uh, 40B housing coming in 10 years ago, and they've managed to postpone it for I believe Hatfield years. is, too. Hatfield is way under. Four percent. Well, well, here we have a representative from East Hampton. Where is East Hampton? Six percent. Uh, South Hadley, five percent. Uh, so, uh, it, it, we're it, above. It, uh, yeah, and some places are, are low. Uh, uh, Plainfield, for example, has virtually no affordable housing, but they're also at no risk for a hostile 40B because. It's not a true way. Not yeah, there's there's not a reason to be rural. there. Mm. You're not going to fill apartments out there. Okay. 
Okay. All right. Well, then we'll have further discussion on this. Good news, David. Something else for you to do. Yeah. If, if you want to involve us, or got any to help? We're more than willing to help, but we don't have any authority, and we're presenting this to you. And well, you know, we're all in this together. It's not. Right. It's not us and you, or us and them. It's, it's this is all of us. Well, you certainly have uh, more expertise on it than we do, and we're more than willing to work with you so we can stay above the ten percent, so that we uh, can at least keep it to a minimum for sure. Yeah. 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 Would you recommend uh, getting into <laughs> negotiations with the, those two dates right now? I, I would. I would recommend doing. Look, there are some possible negotiating points with Mountain View, and I would yeah. recommend that you contact them for. You know, yeah. Joyce knows what we're talking yeah. about. Marlo knows what we're talking about. I, I think you need to develop a plan yeah. of attack here, mm -hmm. and whether you are going to uh, identify a consultant of some sort to do some of the negotiations on your behalf. I don't know if uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission has the capacity. They do have a housing specialist there. Um, I'm not sure what what kind of a role they can play, but. I think it's what you need to do is be out there gathering more information um, mm -hmm. and figuring out what some of your options are. I think that it probably is not a practical task for any of us, including the town administrator, to take this on as a extra task because <coughs> potentially it could drag through years. Mm -hmm. So uh, probably a consultant uh, is the best way to go uh, if you find someone who's really, really well versed in this. Certainly, one more question. Certainly, one more issue. You didn't ask any yet. One more. Jim, uh, can you talk a little bit about the, the if we're done with the affordable housing? Conversation about the marijuana permit limitations that you spoke about. Oh, last time. yeah. So I, when David was at one of our meetings for the marijuana bylaw that, be, that will be proposed at Fall Town Meeting, the selectmen typically, if you're probably read in a newspaper, you base the number of marijuana licenses for retail on your liquor permits. And if you're 20% of your liquor licenses or below, that's considered equivalent to a moratorium, and you're going to go to town meeting and go through all the rigmarole of town meeting and election to ban that. If you're 21% or greater, you can just set the number at whatever we want. So the selectmen need to think about when we, we're supposedly, I think in um, the August meeting, the PVPC is supposed to have the draft marijuana bylaw ready. And it'll be on the fall town meeting more if that's the goal because it expires in November. And so we'll have that done in time. But the select would need to decide what is the percentage of marijuana retail permits you would like, and they recommend basing it on your liquor licenses. I like, no, would like to have a low number, however, um, like I said, anything 20% or below requires is equivalent to moratorium. You've got to go through the two votes of a town meeting and an election to do that. And because the town voted so highly to rep reflect, allow them, you know, that's unlikely to ever pass. So we simply need to set a number, whatever the cycle may decide. So the, the law says you can have a number 20% of your um, off-premise malt and wine. We have five of those total. So rounding up, it would be two adult-use marijuana licenses if you wanted to restrict it to the 20% twenty percent. Is it is it is it based on a malt or the beer and wine for me? Yeah, uh, off premise malt and wine. Okay. Not, not, the, not, not the total not the total, not the total uh, just uh bar permits. One subset of it. Oh okay. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure what it was a subset. So it would be two for us. Okay. So does that change too if we approve new licenses in the future, let's say we have six and we now have to stay at twenty percent of that six or eight or ten. Right. So that way should, should you receive more licenses and we and we have done that by special act of legislation for on premise licenses we had added twelve uh, a couple of years, but that doesn't count towards this particular matter. I have circulated with the Board of Health and the Chief of Police and the Planning Board the, the draft Board of Health regulations for adult use marijuana, so they're going to be working on that over the summer. We'll be working in tandem with the Planning Board in order to get 
both Board of Health regulations and something for town meeting. So in addition to the prototype bylaw, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission is developing for its communities. Uh, I did check with Joel Bard, <coughs> and KP Law is also working on a prototype, which is not ready either. So um, we'll probably be looking at both of them. Hopefully we'll get copies prior to our August meeting with our PVPC rep so we can at least circulate samples around so that people will have an idea of what we're going to be talking about. Just while we have not all the planning board, but four members of the planning board here, um, I just wanted to not complain. I actually wanted to say um, what I'm grateful for, I guess, um, and that's when we're all able to have a dialogue and, and a calm dialogue and listen to each other in a productive way, working for the benefit of the, the town, keeping all of that in mind. And I'm just hopeful that going forward, it's easy for um, certain topics to cause any, any of us to get um, excited and sometimes things don't come out the right way or they come out strongly or people may not perceive a good message coming and I'm just hopeful that going forward um, anytime we're meeting together it's going to go like this because that makes me happy. Emotion, so. emotion can take the better of people. You know, you know, as long as you don't have a whole bunch of microaggressions and it'll be okay. No microaggressions. Yeah, I, I, I detected a couple in your <laughs> you better watch it. Right, we thank you and we will certainly reach out to you to um, help us with this project because this is more under your purview than it is ours. So we'd love to have your help on it and we'll uh, Just ask, ask away. see which, which way we can go. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just kidding, Molly. <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably be there on the 4th of July. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's do the. Um, we have the ambulance service for 2019. We're actually we're going into it for 2018 to 2019. Uh, we have a commitment from Action Ambulance, and I'd like to recognize the committee that has. Uh, worked on this for the past year. On the team. <laughs> <laughs> year, I don't know, this is my fifth or sixth go around on the ambulance committee, so. Um, anyway, I'd like to, um, George Moriarty is here as part of our committee, and thank him. Um, Molly Keegan, Barbara O'Connor, uh, Hank Barstow, Mike, been there right along with us, helping us through this process. Roger, uh, Roger, no, not Roger, oh, it's Stephen no, Barstow. Yeah. <laughs> Stephen, Stephen Barstow, our lieutenant. And an A.B. Fiden Kevich from the, um, Biden rather, sorry, Biden. from the Biden, from the um, Finance Committee. Uh, thank you for bringing this to fruition. Um, we know that action, and we'd like to um, introduce everybody. Mike, would you like to do the honors for me? You guys want to move up? Want to move up to the front here, guys, so everybody can see who you are. And I know that you've been making the rounds and going to the senior center. And uh, Greenleaves, did you make it there? We're getting that scheduled. Getting, getting that scheduled. Um, you've been meeting with the surrounding communities, um, getting to know everybody over there and each place, so we can have mutual aid. Um, so we really do appreciate that, also. Um, this is Michael Rowanka yep. and Frank McNe McNeil, and I'll let you say what your positions are. Sure. <laughs> I'm the Chief Operating Officer and Co-Owner of the Organization. Um, working, work directly with the committee and town officials that's been enjoying the process going through um, a unique process, which is, uh, I think, going to be beneficial to the town in the end. Thank you. Uh, and I serve as the Vice President for the 91 card. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, does anybody, you want to, shall we go into what we're, we have a contract here that needs to. I just want to make sure it was board docs. Do they have the, the one I shipped over to you today? So there was um, some issues with board docs. 
we, we loaded up as much as we could. Okay. Uh, yeah, exhibit B and exhibit C. We didn't, yes. we didn't put in the uh, on board docs the, the uh, information that was submitted as part of our proposal because that's just an attachment. Oh, before, so. the full. I just want to make sure at the right edition of the contract. Yeah. So it's not matching up on the board docs I'm reading, so I just want to make sure. Okay, I've got one dated 612. 612, is that 620 today. I mean, the majority of the stuff is on there. Um, I checked my email to make sure I sent the right one, so I think it was the board doc issue, if I'm, from what I heard, so. Why don't you walk us through the short sure. track? There. I'll just make sure that we have the right stuff going on here. Um, the only changes that we had come up with, we had added the uh, has hazardous materials box uh, that's that was put in there. That is in there. Uh, the other part that I noticed was the uh, the exhibits. So exhibit A is the RFP. Exhibit B is their rebate proposal, and exhibit C is the letter that they sent us with the three years of contract pricing. I just want to make sure you had that. Um, and I believe the only other part was there was one other change we requested as far as equipment. So uh, the defibrillator portion, it's under ambulance and ambulance equipment. Um, it's uh, section eight, and it's letter G, and that should state uh, the part regarding. Uh, Compression device, so the Lucas tool, uh, that is a, it was uh, amended to may include the use of automatic compression device if mutually agreed upon by the contractor and the fire chief. Do you guys currently use those? We don't because uh, the clinical data doesn't suggest that it's actually the right device to be using at this point in time. We're just waiting for the physicians to have the right research data to suggest that's the way to go. Um, Post cardiac arrest discharge using a Lucas device compared to hands on CPR seems to be a little bit less, which is why we haven't adopted the device. I think it's important from our perspective that we want to have an evidence based medicine type of system and using you know the latest research data to support what's happening clinically in the field. So, those that was the highlight. Everything else, all the stuff from legal counsel from the town was put in there, all the Maya, oh, Maya, Kepa. <laughs> Yep, the information is uh, is accurate. Um, I'm not sure how in depth you want to go with all this. Uh, did you get to take a look at the uh, the rebate portion? Mm -hmm. And just wanted to make sure that was acceptable to you. If you had any questions on how that works, uh, the payment terms. That's good. So the startup date will be June 29th, unless it might end up being July 2nd. Yeah, right now we're really trying to work with the state 911 uh, group about the reprogramming of console buttons to be able to do the 911 transfer to do the emergency medical dispatch pre arrival instructions for a call to the system. So it's going to come down to what date the state can firm up for us to do that uh, programming for the 911 system. Uh, the tentatively said that it looks like the 29th is a go, but we have to get something more concrete from them. They've got all the appropriate paperwork for review. Um, they're doing their due diligence right now. Really, it's a calculation about calls, how many do we need more stations, not uh, are there are enough stations in place to do that. But we feel comfortable the approval is going to be uh, pretty forthcoming. Can David talk a little bit about uh, the summaries that you've been sending us, sending us about what's been going on behind the scenes? Because I've had some questions, people are concerned about the transition. I just want to sure. kind of let them know that we've been working. We've been working a lot. Uh, we've been having meetings with, uh, we've had two meetings with the town of Amherst. Uh, we've uh, met with uh, Action EMS. We've uh, met with the police department. Uh, today we talked about uh, dispatching uh, with uh, State 911 making sure that we understood what the, the dispatch, how the dispatching would work, whether we had the capacity to handle the call volumes, who the backup uh, dispatchers were going to be, some of the issues having to do with uh, territory. So if somebody's on Route 9 and traveling east into Amherst, how is that handled? We talked about how that was, that was uh, uh, handled. There's training coming up for the dispatchers over a two-day period. Uh, as well as supervision during the, uh, the changeover. Uh, we're working on um, 
mutual aid agreements and intercept agreements, and that's one of the things we'll be asking you to take a vote to authorize the chair to sign any and all the uh, documents necessary in order to implement the service fully uh, when we're ready to, to roll. So those agreements with South Hadley Districts 1 and 2, the City of Northampton, Town of Amherst, South County EMS, those uh, all are being worked on and we should have those ready early next week, do you think? Yeah. Right now we have a Northampton, South County, so we're just waiting on Amherst and South Hadley District 1 and 2, but they they have the doc they have the information on how to create the document. Most of the communities wanted to make it on their own with the town of Hadley rather than with action airports. So we've been working on the contractual language and there's been a lot of revisions back and forth with the committee with town council, uh, with the uh, fire chief, with the chief of police. Uh, there's been a lot of work logistically, just making room in the uh, fire station for an ambulance. Uh, making sure that we understand our protocols and we're still working on those and it should be ready by the end of this week. So lots of moving parts uh, and a lot of effort on a lot of good people. You, can I just ask about um, UMass? Yes, that, well that's what we, we met today with uh, State 911 for this geofencing right. uh, yeah. that we've been talking about. Yeah. And basically they updated us on how that works. It's a state, it's a state campus. So actually, all of those code, um, all of those calls, under this new enhanced 911, go to the state police. So it's then up to the state police to dispatch it to the appropriate community. So Barb O'Connor is working on that meeting with the with the university, so we can sit down and and talk about that and see how that's all going to work in that little area that's blocked out. Um, mm -hmm. So again, all of those calls go to state police dispatch. Is that that's not what's happening now? Though. Yes. That is what's happening. That is what's happening. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, for some reason, I thought they were going to Amherst. No, well, no, oh, they the go state to police is dispatching it to Amherst. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. cell phone stuff. Mm -hmm. So we're working on that. Um, as far as the transition and dispatch, we do have a, we have a lot of procedures to go through, but um, it's really not changing what's happening too significantly. The buttons being changed from Amherst to Action, and then basically our dispatcher will be toning out the ambulance, the fire department, police department, uh, all at the same time, while the EMD dispatch center is providing all the uh, the information to the patient or the caller. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we're working all, the, all those fine details out right now. I think one of the things that's characterized all of our conversation is that we're focusing on providing care for the people who need it. Uh, and so whatever it is that we need to do in order to ensure that there's an ambulance ready when somebody needs it, uh, that's what we've been focused on. That's been true for the fire department, Action EMS, the police department, town of Amherst, uh, certainly my office. So I think everybody's looking at it from that perspective and that spirit of what's best for the community, what's best for the person who needs the care. We're working on the in-house uh, rules and regulations. We'll be getting their uh, standard SOPs and then we'll fit them into our department, department processes. We've issued them uh, a pager that'll be, you know, they'll have pagers for each of their employees that are on and they'll have radios. They're, they're putting our radio frequencies into all their ambulances that'll be uh, servicing in Hadley. Um, we, I uh, reviewed the uh, medical emergency response plan for the schools today mm -hmm. uh, that's required every three years and that's pretty exciting when you can actually you can change the response times down to a minute, 30 seconds from seven minutes and 50 seconds to 15 minutes. So um, the schools are very excited about that. Uh, the training that, that's coming up that we've been offered is, is great. They're going to uh, allow us to um, ride on the ambulances and start getting our folks transitioned to, into that. Our firefighters, uh, a number of them are EMTs for other departments or you know private services. Um, so it's an opportunity for them to continue and then also for some of us to actually get some experience on an ambulance. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be good. We're going to be working with them. Uh, they're probably going to be backing their ambulance in a little bit earlier so we can start getting used to where all the equipment is, both police and fire. And then uh, we're going to start working with them and actually probably having myself or Evan going out with them just to start getting used to the roads and, and giving them the little lowdowns on where the heavy, heavy, <laughs> heavy stuff is. It was pretty apparent today based upon the enhanced 911 information where the majority of the calls yeah. are. 
it pretty much runs one, the 911 five and Route 9 corridor. Uh, and then uh, Sergeant Cook was uh, great to sit down with and give all the, uh, the numbering situation. So West Street that ends at 40 on one side and starts at 100 on the other. Mm -hmm. So giving them that information so they can start getting a picture in their mind of, you know, the numbering and where roads start and run into another road. And Are we pretty well marked? I mean, I know that there's, a, you know, kind of a law about making sure that all the houses and stuff, but... We have, we have a ways to go. Our uh, state requires, uh, state law requires that folks do it. So as part of any home sale or new business, mm -hmm. they are required uh, as part of their certificate of occupancy to have a house number or uh, it, it needs to be on the street according to the bylaw, but also on, on the house. The state law actually requires it physically on the house. Right. So uh, we had the senior senior center event yesterday and we We've always offered up that for smoke detector installations, and we're also offering up to help out with getting numbers on people's houses if they don't have it yet. They also have the Number Please program through the Senior Center where you can request them to come out and put up one of the, the red signs out on your front, you know, the front lawn, uh, and they do that for a small donation, which is another great backup to uh, the, number, the numbering on the house. I think it's really impressive what you guys have done and the amount of time you've had, and, you know, it seems like you're really doing very thoroughly and all that kind of stuff. So I think you guys all, we owe you a big thanks for doing all that. And I would just say, you know, I don't have any experience in emergency response and that kind of thing, but I've experienced starting up new systems and just make sure, you know, everything is uh, up and running and everybody's comfortable when you're ready to go. Um, so that, you know, whatever date it is, I don't think the, the, the date and hard and fast date we have to swap over by, but that everything is in place and people can be assured their safety at that time. Yeah. Um, well, the you know, one good take your time, I guess, is what I'm saying. Well, like, the take one the extra good thing time is it's coming it. out of the fire station and they know where everything is. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that's that's a plus in itself there that they'll be working together. Mm -hmm. um, so, I can t tell you that we are tentatively scheduled to actually start the final two. Uh, firefighters will be there going through their physicals and and uh, psychological evaluations right now, but we'll be presenting to them to you shortly. Uh, there hasn't been any upfront concerns about them passing that. That's coming up pretty quickly. They finished their psychological evaluations today. Um, so the tentative date for them to start is the same date as the ambulance. So we'll be moving into our seven days a week, 12 hour shifts, four on, four off. So it's kind of really exciting that they will be going out at the same time as the ambulance during those hours to make sure you know, everybody knows where they're going. Everything up and running. So everything's getting there. It's been a long road. So, so no offense other than at social events, really hope not to see you guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, welcome. Yeah. Thank so, you. To action. So um, since we moved this up by a couple days, just with the holiday and whatnot, uh, the holiday weekend, I guess it was, um, you guys have your medics already hired, your your rig ready to go. As, uh, where do we stand logistically? Are we far in advance all, all set here, or are we going to be scrambling the last couple of days? The so the rig that's going to come to town is actually on Russell Street right now in our property there. So okay. it's just a question of moving it over. Uh, the radios have all been programmed with the appropriate frequencies. We probably need to just do some testing on, on air testing. Um, the staff um, is not completely in place. That is evolving and coming together, but we have enough staff in our entire system to staff the truck until it finally gets settled. Um, we're going to have the same people working the same days of the week um, in the system, so they'll be working a 24-hour shift the same day each week, so at least they'll know the same people are on Monday, the same people are on Tuesday, Wednesday, etc., uh, both from the PD's perspective and also from the buyer's perspective as well. So um, we're pretty comfortable about this. The reason that we're looking at the 29th is because if we went with July 1, it was a Sunday, and we're really concerned if there was a programming problem on a Sunday morning with the 911 circuits, then that was going to be problematic. And actually Amherst had the idea to probably not do the cutover on a Sunday morning. Um, yeah, that's a little, it's easy to do it on a business day. Welcome. Thank you. It's, uh, we have a great team here. You know, it's really been a, a lot of fun working with them and working through the processes and, and um, understanding where the town wants to be down the road was an important part of that. But I think we discussed that with the committee at length and knowing that allows us to build the foundation now to ultimately get there. Yeah. Which is good. We're excited. Could I ask one other question? We did ask for you to put together the ambulance the review committee. The, I don't know if that's, um, I know you have some time after the contract signed, but do you have an idea when that might be? 
going. We'd like to get that in sooner than later so we can maybe get some meetings scheduled right off the bat to make sure that we're, you know, probably be a little bit more active at the beginning to make sure we're reviewing everything. So I just... Yeah, I would hope we'd be doing it soon. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I thought we might be doing it tonight, but I'm not sure that you had the I haven't, I haven't anybody that, you know, I don't, are we just going to, George, you want to be on that? Which one's this? <laughs> <laughs> I volunteered for one last time. That's what I was just wondering. <laughs> that was, I think yeah. So far, so was yeah. I'll do it. Hank, Hank. Yeah, Hank or, just so we can yeah. follow through with what we have to on. And it's one ref yeah, from the sure. select board, too, correct? Yes. I'm happy to, but I'm also happy if somebody else is interested. You know, or, or do it for a little while as a transition and then turn it over to however you want to work it. So, George, you get in. Me for now? Okay. All right, and then we can. Yes, if you could take two votes tonight, or one combined vote, uh, vote to sign the contract and also to authorize the chair or her designee to sign any documents necessary in order to uh, affect the uh, ambulance service for the town of Pamela. That will include um, mutual aid agreements and intercept agreements at a minimum. Make a motion to approve the Action Ambulance Contract that you kind of have the, the June 20th version with the exhibits A, B, and C. Yeah. Second. And that will run from July 1st, 2018 to June 30th, 2020. Or June 29th. Or June 29th. Or June 29th. Yeah. Technically. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Did you want to and, take a vote? Oh, yeah. I was going to. I can make a motion to oh, man, the, ch uh, the chair or her designee sign any documents pertaining to the ambulance service contracts. Second. Okay. Aye. 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 Do we need to vote on the other side, or can we just start that for now? And then start yeah, I'll, I'll, we should, we should uh, mm -hmm. put it on an agenda so we have a formal notice to the public that anybody who might be interested can submit their name. So we'll take that up on July 11th. Yes. I just, I just. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Best of luck to you guys. I do, I do want to take a look at the ambulance, but I don't want to be a patient. <laughs> I would like to review it. <laughs> I don't want to take a ride. Yeah, <laughs> Seeing my share of them. Thank you for all of your work on the contract. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. So, uh, where are we? Annual appointments. Talk about here, I, I think, uh, 
I'm happy to talk about anything, is um, the uh, North Hadley Fire Substation Building Committee. Uh, two things that we'd like to change is one is the name of it, so it's now the Fire Substation Building Committee, and also change the term to uh, for the life of the project as we have done for both the library and the senior center. And we did need to remove Franco Quadro's name from that list. He's not a member anymore. Okay. Um, so I'll make a motion to approve um, as presented with the modifications just articulated. For a second. A second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. But he's appointed. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Flea market. Sergeant Cook, would you like to run us through this? I'm sure, we've all had a few calls on this occasionally. Chief Mason is here also. Thank you. Is there a problem with traffic? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no. The bridge is fixed. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's still a backup, believe it or not. <coughs> Mitch, do you want to, Sergeant Cook, would you like to run this through us about, uh, we needed to kind of revise on the flea market on 47 that runs from early morning Sundays until the afternoon. Uh, we've had traffic problems there over the years and a few weeks ago um, it was quite the backup and people parking along the sides of the road and really not much room for even a public safety vehicle to get through there if they needed to. So we had conversation and then you also did some um, reconstruction up there. Would you like to go through that? Sure. Um so everyone at home knows that uh, obviously a couple of weeks ago we got inundated with calls, traffic complaints, uh, parking complaints from area residents. And uh, immediately following that, I uh, conference with the chief and we implement, implemented some immediate changes to uh, how we function down there. Um, immediately start following the, the following weekend we hired a third detail officer to be down there uh, we uh, hired a detail officer to go out and also put up the no parking signs uh, our third officer on sundays is designated as, as the officer in charge of the flea market and works with the officers that are on patrol um, so those are some immediate changes that we made and then there were a number and the third officer you put on is who's Mr. Shaw. Thank you. So uh, we have been working with Mr. Shaw for on an annual basis to try to improve this. And usually there's about one weekend in the beginning of the flea market season that we pretty much have a major traffic issue. And uh, this past year it was later than usual due to the uh, weather. The weather was uh, there was rain pretty much every weekend for about the first four or five weekends and then this a couple of weeks ago it was the first nice weekend so it was pretty much the perfect storm so um, we've worked with them and uh, in the past couple of years we have had them make some changes and one of those changes was we've moved all the vendors from the north side of the flea market and combined them and made that whole north side along the fence parking um, we've asked them to redo their traffic inside and make it so that cars can't just do a loop and, uh, and just come right back out and makes them go all the way down through the back parking area and look for a parking space. Um, but I think that if we had twice the amount of parking available, I don't think it would have made a difference on this particular day. But uh, some things that I've also done is I've looked at the uh, GIS database and Google Maps, and uh, Mr. Shaw has a large amount of property in the back that appears to be overgrown you know, with trees and things like that. Um, 
it's not used for parking, so I don't know what the viability is for it to be land cleared and used for parking, but you've got a fair, fairly sized piece of property back there that's available to them. Um, one of the other items that I've suggested to him is to better coordinate with his vendors. And essentially, when vendors go into the flea market, they're allowed to choose wherever they'd like to set up their spot, if you will. And what that does, and if you go to the flea market, you drive through there and you look through the vendor areas, you see that there are literally just blank spots in the middle of some of these rows. And, uh, and it's really easy if you look at the Google map and look at the flea market, it just so happens the Google map was taken on a Sunday and you can see all the different areas that are just open and unused. So one of the things that we've suggested to him that at least at this point it doesn't seem that he's adopted it, but essentially um, having his vendors filing in from the front and basically filling in all the available spots that are in the front and then when there's none you move to the next row and to the next row. And so when all the vendors are in, whatever's left over is all parking. So um, in, in addition to that, um, just some smaller things that we probably need to entertain. Permanent no parking signage uh, along Route 47. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, parking was so bad, people were parking on Chimura Road and walking the distance to go to the flea market. Um, Parking was all along the side of Route 47 as well. It was it was a, a little mess. People's property. People's property, front lawns, things like that. So um, we did have uh, we put temporary signs out. Hopefully um, that will maybe some of the problems temporarily. Um, and then one of the other suggestions, which is just a, a, a small thing for officer safety, is that. Uh, if anyone's ever driven through a work zone and a utility company working, you know that there's advanced warning signs out there. Let's say there's an officer that have their big bright orange signs. And uh, those are something that um, I asked um, Mark, um, Mr. Warner, the DPW director, to look into and, and go through the municipal traffic uh, device guide and make some suggestions as well. So that's kind of a quick run through of what I forwarded to you. How was it last weekend? It was, it was okay. quieter than usual. They didn't have, it wasn't busy, really busy enough to get a real good test of. It was Father's Day too, so. Seventh day it was 95 degrees. 95. It was warm. Yeah. yeah. The weather's really the biggest determining factor. Uh, if, it's, if it's raining out, if, it, if it's forecasted to rain, it's pretty much, you can call it pretty easily that it's going to be slow. Um, and if it's going to be nice, then. And the first time it's nice, it's, it's that's always the perfect storm. Yeah. Well, that's my understanding. This is something that's permitted on an annual basis, and it's in December, so we might not be able to do anything this year, but next December we can maybe have a little more leverage well, to my understanding make some the, changes. The permitting process, and I, don't, I wasn't at the meeting where he was granted his permit this past time, but my understanding is that it's almost always granted with uh, the authority of the public safety to make any adjustments. To shut, it, to shut it down if you need to. Well, I can't even tell you. I, I can't tell you how many times we've actually closed it uh, and forced traffic past. The problem is, is that unless we close it for the day, okay. people just drive by, they turn around, and they come back, or they, they'll turn around and come back the other way. and. Um, Really, what it comes down to is, is we're gonna. We, that's really what the test was for this past Sunday with the no parking signs. If we had to shut it down, it was going to be shut down um, and act almost like air traffic controllers and just keep flushing them past. Sorry, this runway is closed, so to speak. Uh, that was the plan. We just didn't get enough volume to actually test it. Um, so there's some other there's some other things that Ray is going to have to do as it relates to fire. Uh, code, uh, I'm not really sure what the term is, but uh, permitting for propane and things like that that he's not, he's not up to, to date on. Uh, I went, actually went uh, and uh, met with him today at his house. Uh, the issue with the land, I don't know that there's anything that he can do with that land. It's um, APR. I don't know if you're allowed to even clear it. I don't really know what the rules are on that. So 
that was what was stated to me today. They are willing to make some adjustments to, uh, I had a long talk with them with their staffing as far as what they're supposed to be doing, uh, what they do do and what they're supposed to be doing, as well as uh, they, they wanted to bring on some more folks to act as flaggers, which is kind of one of the things that we've been asking them to do for a while now. Um, so that we don't have the congestion inside of the flea market uh, as as much and we can get more cars off the road and, uh, and into the flea market. You know, because his comment to me was is that, well, there's parking down back. And I said, well, the police don't know there's parking down back if nobody tells them and they're not running down there to find we, out if there is. Yeah. Well, we had actually tried, uh, one of the things that we did try a few years ago was hiring a third or fourth detail officer and actually put one back into the parking lot. And that's when we noticed the U-turn issues. That's actually how we found out about those problems. So we that's how, where we started to fix them. Um, but those are, the, those are the things that we're going to implement now. Uh, and, you know, when it comes back up for renewal uh, next year, we're hoping to have some more suggestions on some more fixes. Um, Certainly would like chiefs to have and sergeant to have uh, you know, um, an input into us when we do make that decision. So. Just for the people watching at home, all the additional detail expense and signage expense and all that is coming out of the flea market operator's pocket, not your budget. Correct. 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 Jane, that was my question. Yeah. They pay for all the police. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, well, yes. they pay for all the police until we get buried with traffic and then we have to use the patrol officers to help flush them out of there. That's happened quite often, but it's not an entire day. It's, they're already on patrol. But I, mm -hmm. I, I've, I've fielded calls with that specific complaint in the past. How long is our patrol officers down there? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So that has happened, but so they're for paying for the detail officers. So as far as the um, time frame on the issues that the fire department has, is, is there a deadline in place as to when they need to be rectified? Or? Well, the issue is, is they're not they're not static things. So something different could come in every week. So we're going to have to, as Mitch and I were discussing, we're going to have to probably assign somebody to the flea market on Sundays to go out and walk through and actually do permits for the folks that are showing up. Because you might have a French fry vendor there one weekend, but they don't come to the following weekend. So you may have somebody from the call force or? or it would be a full-time firefighter full who's first with that, or myself. Um, and the that other would thing also is, have to be paid for, correct? Correct. Well, I mean, there's a permit fee attached to that, but we were also discussing, we have a number of medical calls there that are quite hairy with being able to access the patients. So we're actually talking with, um, well, obviously our firefighters, but maybe staffing with a firefighter and an EMT with our brush tube that can actually make it through that. Treated like an event, and like actually event. charge them a detail rate for that that vehicle. Has that been discussed with Mr. Shaw? It has not yet. No. I'd certainly be supportive of that. <coughs> I would. I probably have to go back and look at the language that was used when you voted on his last permit. I would imagine that it's general enough that you probably take action on that now. But you probably just have to make sure. Yeah, the permit says any uh, order of conditions apply the chief of police. So whatever you say goes. Well, so can you tell me what to say and then I say it? <laughs> That's the deal. Well, the flammable fluids are under Mass General Law, so it's it's required by Mass General Law. Not, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be bound by a contract signed by this life Right. That's anybody that has a portable. Uh, anybody that has open propane. Prior, that's yeah. Those kind of things. Not attached to the is permit. there is there a way that we can force them to get their permits, say the Friday before, and then anybody who doesn't have it that shows up without a permit and is setting up, that we can find them or take other action that can, so that way we can alleviate the pressure on your staffing situation. The o the only issue is there's an inspection required because we have to inspect the okay. the tanks and the suppression system. system. So yeah. it, it might be easier just to issue them the permit right on scene. We, we have done that, for example, for the Asparagus Festival, we try and get them up front, but usually it's easier just to go out the day out because there's trucks rolling in that we had no idea that were coming. Yeah, events like that are, are much more organized up too. This is not, this is not, okay. yeah. Typically we renew this uh, kind of organized. <laughs>
typically we renew the, uh, the license in each December, but if there's a public safety issue that's compelling, there's no reason why the select board can't take action when it's needed. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you need to set up a condition that inspections will occur Thursday or Friday beforehand or whatever makes sense logistically, uh, you can do that if it's a public safety issue. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to see him make a good faith effort to show that he's trying to solve the problems on his end waiting, instead of waiting for you guys to show up and force something upon him. It'd be nice to kind of Some, take the initiative. Sometimes that doesn't work. Yeah, I know, but... I, and, and it hasn't over the years. We've basically had to yeah. set the rules and regulations um, for this flea market. It's It's been going on for well over five years that we've had to well, maybe we intervene. Maybe a harder look in December when the permit renewal comes yeah, out, but that's not yeah. the case. And that's the yeah. problem, because right. it's in December and you're that far away from it. Yeah. And then By then you have fairy forgotten dust about is all the <laughs> 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 Until the first I mean, weekend. In his defense, you know, today when I when I did meet with him, I was over at his house for a considerable period of time. He, he, uh, he definitely expressed uh, you know, interest in trying to take some initiative. I think he's just a little a little hazy on what direction he needs to go in and what that initiative is. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it seems like open to suggestions. Well, so it seemed like it was better than in past years. He's mm -hmm. you know he doesn't want to lose that income that he has. Yeah. You know, so okay. And just one more question: Is that road pattern? where they're close together like that, is that preferred over having another road like to the south or something like that, where you know the, the entrance and exit could be on opposite ends of that property line, or is that not possible? I'm just wondering. I'm not sure I understand just, the question. Really. Well, like, because you have so many detail officers, the best having them both in one spot near that entrance and exit that are right close to each other, mm -hmm. as opposed to it being like, you know, however wide that property is, 300 feet, 400 feet apart. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, all the activity is at that at that location. Though the only other spot that it would make sense having another officer would be in a cruiser. Oh, I mean, if he moved the road, like had a better traffic pattern on the whole site, like maybe that'd be a suggestion for the future or something. Yeah, like I, just, I don't know. I don't know traffic studies. But well, that's and like, that's part of the other problem. Is yeah, that, you know, we aren't experts in that area yeah. either, so he would have to bring probably an engineer on um, to do that kind of work. Yeah, if he's got the money for it. He's willing. I'm. More yeah. than willing to take whatever those suggestions are. But we well, have let's to let's see how the down. rest of this year goes and make some adjustments if we need to when the license comes up and go from there. Since right. you've already working started on past statistics, working on past statistics, they actually do a pretty good job. They have a counter down there that that automatically counts cars are going in. And using the statistics that I was shown today, there are at least two or three other Sundays throughout the year where there will be high traffic volume. Um, most cases we can predict and plan for things like that, um, but you know, Mother's Day is also usually a pretty big weekend for him, and it was it was nothing this year. So, so what are we talking about first? Car, as far as uh, vehicle traffic numbers, uh, uh, the day the day that uh, this was terrible, I believe the highest number he had was probably around 2,700 cars. But he's that was, she was showing me numbers throughout this past year, and there was some days where. I know they were, we were getting a lot of complaints where they had up to 30 seconds in the cars. Can we put a toll booth at 14 feet? <laughs> yeah, I, did. I, mean, I said you could charge for parking, you only have to have it one Sunday throughout the whole year and you're done. Everybody will suffer for one Sunday and then you're okay. Coming through Salisbury a couple weekends ago, there was actually DPW workers out there saying, uh, contribute to Salisbury. I mean, they were looking to get money for people to go to the beach. It was a great idea. We can do it at the bridge. <laughs> Pay to come over and do that. Like, yeah, yeah, booth. Sounds great to me. Yeah, okay. So, um, did that sign relieve any traffic that you had up there? Um, the main reason we put the sign out there was um, for when uh, oil collar college was going to graduate oh, okay. so we were we were fortunate we were fortunate that weekend that the weather was forecasted to be less than desirable so the flea market wasn't that busy but in past years when it's been really nice that's weather a that's a really really bad day because you get all the folks coming to go to Mount Holyoke trying to get to this flea market traffic so um, it, it's hard to measure but um, it seems well I remember last year when the bridge was open 
the first good weekend because I drove up there to see you and it was bad. The worst. Yep. Worst I ever seen it last year. Mount Holyoke actually paid for a couple of their own detail officers on that weekend, but it was only that really? weekend. That bridge was out for a while. Yeah. So. Okay. We'll move on to the next one, but thank you. Appreciate okay. it. Goals and objectives for the select board. Looks like an awful lot. We're not going to read every one of them tonight. Um, that will be your homework for our next meeting. So this, this kind of gives the select board uh, on what our goals and objectives we should be making. Uh, coming off, <laughs> you're giving me that look. <laughs> Continue and then they yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. You know, um, it's a lot of things to go through tonight to um, report on each one. Um, what was your thoughts? <laughs> so, so what we have here is the outcome of we had spoken previously about asking the department heads to go through and look particularly at their administrative functions. So I think this is a. Um, uh, could provide fodder for probably a subset of the goals and objectives for the select board, but one of the specific things we wanted to look at was um, we've been talking about the need for additional staffing, particularly particularly in the areas of human resources, IT, and, and finance. Um, and obviously, we're, you know, we weren't in a position to fund any of that, but that kind of engendered a conversation about do we really have the right people now in the right places doing things, um, and particularly this started at Town Hall, um, and I kind of picked up it as the liaison to the Town Hall staff that there's some departments who are clearly underserved and other departments who probably have appropriate staffing, but what are people actually spending their time on, and is there a way to maybe um, form a subcommittee of some kind just to look at some of these administrative functions to say, gosh, I mean, do we really need to be creating an Excel spreadsheet or can an investment in technology take care of some of these things or maybe this person has skill sets that are better deployed elsewhere? So um, I was hoping that maybe we could just talk a little bit about that tonight and get the go-ahead to move forward with that and ask David to put that group um, together, look for, for volunteers to do that, because it's town-wide. I mean, that's why we have the police department, DPW, and everybody in here, not just town hall. But that, that would be the idea. It's looking for uh, efficiencies so that we could maybe make some recommendations coming back on more appropriate staffing. Well, let's just do it. I, I also took it as, uh, I was reading through here, and some of them were kind of just lists of what everybody was doing. It was kind of confusing, and I thought that Park and Rec and uh, Jen, the licensing coordinator, did a good job of having a little more narrative about Contents, their needs, yeah. too, so I didn't know that aspect to it, but saw that they had some nice context as far as what their needs were. Mm -hmm. um, that could help set us some goals, too, so. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. And so I think, um, I mean, they did an awful lot of work um, putting all of this together. And then I think the next step, logically, is if we get this work group formed, then there are probably going to be interviews that have to happen to say, OK, tell me more about that. You know, how does this fit in? You know, there may be things on here that people are doing that really don't need to be done or could be done elsewhere. Oh, collectively, also. Yeah. Because yeah. there's some of them that were just a basic list. That yeah really tell us much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but in fairness, that's what yeah. they were asked, yeah. you know, yeah. so. It's kind of thing into it a little bit. So. <laughs> yeah. So is everybody okay with sure. kind of yeah. pursuing that as a project? Yeah. Okay. Right, David? We're spending quality time together. So, <laughs> so what, are you pro what are you proposing? More. Um, so. More work for me. No, no. no. So Summarize this. <laughs> yeah, so if we go. I think the next step would be <laughs> to go back to um, the department head meeting, which is where this kicked off, and then talk to them about what's been put together and ask for some volunteers. Um, and it's possible may maybe even you know, a community member may be interested in, in helping as well, somebody who has some organizational skill sets like management experience or something. But um, I know that 
you know, certainly Linda Sanderson and, and uh, some of the folks at Town Hall were keenly interested in getting this, having this looked at. So, yeah, and so then we could come back maybe after that conversation takes place and tell the select board what the re recommendation is specifically. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Yeah. So I'm happy to pick this up. I'm working on the capital plan right now as well as the ambulance implementation. So if we could uh, be comfortable with about 10 days of my time focused elsewhere, then Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm not thinking what, this is happening wrap up, tomorrow. Wrap up what you're doing. Go on vacation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You need a vacation. <laughs> we moved the capital committee meeting out, so he yeah. has some extra yeah. time. Yeah. 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 Thank yeah. you. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Yeah. There you go. And I think this isn't something that has a hard and fast deadline. It's really something that can be, you know, look at it almost like a continuous improvement thing that is consistently evolving. Do Do we want to separate it out at all? as far as staffing and possible overlaps go versus looking at goals of departments and what people want to do or have some initiative to do, kind of kind of two different buckets Absolutely. instead of throwing it into one. Yeah. So I, how do we handle that? I wasn't <laughs> thinking this of this honestly, other yeah. than this project would be a goal of the select board to accomplish. Okay. Yeah. Not that this was actually Well, we could start with the first subcommittee and see where you can decipher off what belongs here in town hall, and uh, then we can work off of that with the, mm -hmm. for the other. Okay. What would be my suggestion? So will this be something that's standing on our agenda, or something that will go into the well, town administrator report? How would that? Well, they're going to the work on it first. Yeah. So okay. We're going to the framework it. first, and okay. then we'll come back yeah. to you. Okay. Yeah, so let's give it a little bit of time uh, here. August 11th agenda. So you guys are going to work on it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. August 11th, there'll be something on okay. the agenda. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And just for the record, the clear intent is not to put this on David's lap. It's just David to be a participant in the process. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You hear that? Okay. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Uh, old Business Senior Center and Library Building Project updates. Well, as you all know, we met with the planning board. Most of you know, we met with the planning board last night. And we were quite discouraged with the hostile reception we had from a town board that theoretically this is something the town has voted for six times. And we had no sense of cooperation about having it happen. I would say, um, based on the feedback I've gotten from other library um, committee building members, that they, they probably share that, that sentiment at this point. But there was a to-do list coming out of the meeting, right? So um, quite a long one. Pardon? Quite a long. Quite a long one. Yeah. Um, so it's being continued until July 17th, I believe, is the date. But the, I think, um, just in summary, and in, in group, of, and then here all the most many of us were there, and then some of us were just enjoying it from from home, live streaming. Um, it seemed like the biggest issue that I heard um, is an interpretation of the parking requirement. Um, and that's something that I would think that when Tim and I heard us back, um, his, his name came up and we're going to have to wrap him back to the conversation. I know that his vacation has already been interrupted um, with some outreach there. So uh, I think we're going to want to clarify that. It seems like the attorney has a, a, a laundry list of things to resolve. The other thing is, before that meeting, we were told by Mr. Dwyer that one of the ways you can move this right through is if you get a clean peer review. And we actually have a clean peer review from Berkshire Design, mm -hmm. which would include the parking issue. Mm -hmm. But that was ignored. Mm -hmm. And um, then there was also um, kind of a strong questioning of the drainage plan. It was another one that engendered a fair amount of back and forth. <coughs> And the third big issue had to do with snow in the DPW. As well as looking at an opinion from the select board, what we're going to do with the Goodwin Memorial Library, because that should be included somehow with this project they've deemed. But, but it's not. In it's my opinion, that is not included yeah. in this project. No. Yeah. Nothing to do yeah. with the project itself. Right. So do we need to put together a statement of some kind to 
in advance of the July 17th meeting to let them know the position of the select board in that regard? But I just, I, I just want to say something. Actually, were any of us really surprised that it was going to go any differently? No. Because that's what they had projected long before that meeting even took place. That that's what they were all in line to do. And they certainly um, exhibited their, I better stop now. Um, because I, I think that they were, weren't very professional. I, I'd just like to add my say so too because I, I've spoken with some of the people that were at the senior center today and the general reaction was outrage that these people could be so rude, so unhelpful, so obstruction to us. Uh, and we know from what, walking, watching them in other situations that they're helpful. To people and, and work with them. Well, I think we, we saw that last night. Until tonight. Tonight. Tonight yeah. was a, an example of um, sure. how it would be nice for things to move along all the time. Yeah, but uh, but we feel very discouraged because it's clearly had an agenda to prevent the project from going through. And it's a mystery to me as to why they do. But. Uh, the other thing that's costing the town and the projects money by the delays, constant delays, and that is one of their tactics that they have actually stated, which is we're just going to delay this till you run out of money. And the planning board did that. They didn't even start to hear it, and they said we're going to continue it. Yeah, yeah, right at the beginning. At the very beginning. <laughs> did you? I, I was. On the personal side, I was, I didn't think it was in the best interest of the town to spend that type of money on a library to start with. I was for the senior center and I am still for the fire station. But the people have voted four times, five times? Yes. That's it. It's over. I think, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I, I'd like to make a recommendation, you know, from the board saying, let's move on. It's over. The people have voted too many times already for the library and for the senior center. Well, what yeah. I took away from the meeting last night was that I think the biggest... Well, there's a couple issues that we need to discuss them. Yeah, the, the biggest hurdle seems to be the parking issue. And there's, I, I, from what I gather, the difference in interpretation between the planning board and the building inspector is one of the main issues. So I think if we can get that ironed out, Snow removal, like those are kind of relatively minor compared to the parking issue. Um, so I don't know when Tim's back, but I think that's one of the other parking issues. Is this is not a building where it's an office building and people come from nine to four. Right. I go for a class from nine to ten thirty. I go home. Somebody else comes in at ten, goes to class at noon. They come for lunch. They come and they go. It's not a constant use of that lot. Right. And the same is true with the library. Yes, you have staff there all day. Four people, maybe. Unless there's a big event. Huh? Unless there's a big event. Right? Exactly. But I think that looking at parking in that terms, it's not like somebody that's constantly in use. Well, and I think that there certainly a question was raised in the audience um, that you know likely needs to be resolved again before July 17th as to whether or not a municipal property of that nature is actually subject, if they were actually quoting the, the bylaw, I mean, it looked like it was coming in under the commercial use and, and whether or not this should qualify for the same treatment for the, just the reasons you stated. I mean, that's not how these things work. That's not how they operate. Well, we would appreciate anything the select board could do to expedite our getting our bids out to the contractors and starting the project. Mm -hmm. There's not much we can do with the planning board. They're on their own agenda. They have their own purview of what they have to do. Um, I'm not sure how we can, as a select board, I think we voted forward. a couple times already. But it, it, We've already voted. Yeah. We already supported. Um, they're doing their process and they're being not nice about it. Well, at the extreme, though, they could kill the projects. And, and what what can but, we do? What can we do about it? 
know, I guess we're going to have to well, look uh, through our town and journey. It, it, it and is extreme, but it, it uh, you know, to have a, a board that is so negative. I don't think they may be able to prolong it, but they can't. Uh, I can't I deny the site. I can't deny the site plan, but they can't. They can delay it per meeting, per meeting, requesting, and we've seen them do that with Home Depot, Lowe's, other projects that were going to bring money into the town, um, and how many votes did we have on those projects? Um, yeah, I you know, Lowe's. <laughs> so, I mean, we had a lot of different issues going on at different times, and uh, they just run their course like they do, but, you know, we have to maybe see if there's other, other avenues that we can... But are, so what, at what point does the library lose its grant if we can't move forward? Well, that's true. And can we draft a letter from the select board just urging them, you know, about the Goodwin Library, making the point about costing taxpayers the money They wouldn't every even month. let me speak last night to, I say, know that. That, I know to that. say that we had an agreement with, you know, the Legion. So yeah. uh, they didn't want to hear that at that point. So. And they didn't yeah, want to hear the Historical should. Commission's opinion. Right. They can't have their cake and eat it, too, on that one, you know. I think so the they didn't want to hear anything that would, would be positive. No. I think the one positive that did come out is we kind of fine-tuned it down to the three major list. issues in, in this list that, once we have this knocked out, should be all. And oh, so if, if right, and Bill Dwyer's assertion that it's not in concert, in his opinion, with the master, with the master plan, plan right. which, yeah. which is, is pure. I do want to thank you for two weeks ago letting us hire a lawyer. So I don't understand if, if uh, Tim Neihart has one position on the parking and they have another position on the parking, who gets the final say? You say they can't deny the site plan. Do you mean that they can't deny it as it is eventually? Or it's who, who's going to resolve? Who has the final say with the parking? Right. That's a very good question. Right. So they can't, they can't, from what we understand from council, can't deny it, but they can keep asking for it. Yeah, so they can make reasonable requests about dimensions and adequacy of parking and emergency entrances and exits, et cetera. And, so and they, lighting. And lighting. Um, yeah. You know, the interpretation of that the... Was on the list. The interpretation of parking is going to be a little bit of... Uh, a matter of talking this through because there are different standards for parking within the own, within the bylaws. Whether it applies at all, how does it apply? Who has rights to to waive that parking? What is how does that uh, how does the off street parking figure into it? All of these things are there in the bylaws, but they're not as clear as one might have hope that they are. So we're going to have to work our way through that one. Joyce I, I just wondered, um, this two for one square footage requirement for parking is, is a real obstacle. And my fear is that in an effort to define and redefine what is parking and what is the driveway in this case, and whether or not parking is required for the outside patio area, which was another thing that was brought up last night, I, I have this fear that unless someone takes the initiative and drafts a, a bylaw uh, that exempts the town from the parking two to one bylaw, we're going to be jammed up here. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand why a town, a municipality, would need to conform to that kind of stringent Walmart mentality for municipal use. Yeah, yeah I feel like they're putting, you know, Bill at the end mentioned something about it not complying to the master plan, which promotes a walking town center, yet we have this two-to-one restriction, which is a strip mall provision, basically, and so it's counterproductive. It doesn't apply. And, I mean, I know plenty of people that walk in the town center, and so, I, I don't know, they're kind of up against the wall there, but it yeah. isn't by law. Would that be a, something for a uh, special town meeting to draft a... Uh, by law to just 
for, for sure, a vote at that talking. point. Or, I mean, cool. obviously that's down Which the line. Which lawyer would you like to use on that one? <laughs> yeah, all of them. No. <laughs> <laughs> Which oh, yeah. one would you like to do? I mean, Same. if we don't get beyond the July 13th, 17th meeting, then right. October is around the corner. Well, yeah, right. At least if we could have an end game and no, because I don't see that they're going to change their position on this. If they're if they're playing a game with definitions, then they're not, there's no incentive to stop doing that. There's every incentive, every time, to ask the same questions over and over again. Well, so, I mean, I think we do have the ZBA option. Um, yes. It's what is, I'm sorry to interrupt. Could you explain what that is, the ZBA option? Mm -hmm. They can override the planning board's decision. They, okay. Right, correct? Yeah, you can ask for a you can ask for a variance. Or, variance, but um, that variance can't be held self but we have Right, heard exactly. That, exactly. We have heard that the the planning board has has constantly been in touch with the with the uh, appeals board, so CBA, and, and have basically instructed them not to act on this roofing issue, which is a really stupid. Well, they can't do that. Well, can I? So, can I just make a suggestion? I think. I think there are an awful lot of people in town right now who are looking for some leadership on this issue. Um, and I think we've, we've tried to respect our form of government. Um, we should respect our form of government. I mean, we, try, we should. If we have a form of government, we should follow it. But um, sometimes the government isn't exactly working as intended. And I think that's what an awful lot of people with, um, are feeling about these two projects. Again, how many times does town meeting need to speak? So we have a plan in place right now, which is to let the planning board do what the planning board does. I mean, and again, we may not have liked how, you know, how things were presented last night or how people were treated, um, but they had a right to take the positions that they took and ask for further work on it. And I think that um, if you, if we go to the July 17th, then maybe there can be some conversations with the planning board in advance of that about, okay, you know, our attorney thinks this about the parking issue or whatever, and try, try to see if we can reach some agreement going into that to reach a resolution and to have them vote one way or the other on July 17th. And it's either going to be a thumbs up or a thumbs down, and we should have a game plan in place if in fact it's a it's a thumbs down what does that mean the next steps are and, and i don't you know i'm certainly not prepared to say what that is tonight but i think before july 17th the select board should have a position on that i, I particularly like what you said it should be either a thumbs up or thumbs down meeting because of course many of us thought that that was the meeting that was the night was for, right. in that case we quickly found out it was that they had no one no intention of reaching the decision on this night. So. Well, I didn't think they would. I had no, no, I had no doubt they well, would last I, night. Well, I wasn't surprised, I, no, but... I had no doubt that that wasn't happen last night. Joyce, do you no want to, surprise. Do you want to talk quickly about what you were going to say last night about one of the hurdles that might have been removed from the... Well, I just said we reached an agreement with the Legion, okay. Legion. so uh, if I was in order to say that, Mr. Zagrodnik's uh, comment about not being able to vote on the project because he's a legionnaire. Well, that has no bearing on it now whatsoever because they're not in the mix of things. And saying he's a senior sen senior member, well, so are I. Big deal. So that means I can't vote on it. You know, that has no bearing on it either. So um, that's what I think about his ethics thing. So. Um, okay. So maybe I don't know. When are we meeting between now and the seventeenth? July 11th. July 11th? Yeah. So maybe we can have this as a some more focused discussion on where we're at at that point with the, the issues list that they did raise. Well, we need to get some advice from somebody. Yeah, exactly. So. You, have, you have counsel, so I think that we should uh, talk to counsel at your next meeting. Mm -hmm. Which one? Yes. <laughs> Which one are you talking to, Mr. David? Mr. Reedy. Okay. Yeah, I mean, Tom's the one who walked away with, I mean, he made sure that they documented what all of their issues were, and he, he has that list. Okay, just want to make sure where we're going and what, uh, but we also have to look from the town side of it, mm -hmm. and that would be our lawyer on this side about what our rights are as a select board, and that doesn't necessarily bring in Mr. Reedy on this one. There's some other yeah. things that I'd like to have a conversation with you about. Yeah. 
So can we maybe have as much of that laundry list of items taken care of by the 11th as possible so that way we know what we're, you know, mm -hmm. that would be up to plan. Mr. Reedy with that end of it. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. It's already being worked on. All right. Let's move on to special act of legislation for the treasurer and the collector. All right, so at the last town meeting we passed uh, two articles that uh, allowed the town to uh, petition the uh, general court in uh, Boston to create uh, two acts of special legislation to um, convert the position of elected collector to appointed collector and to change the uh, position of elected treasurer to appointed uh, treasurer. Uh, House of Representatives Council is uh, offering these amendments um, that are in front of you. They are editorial in nature. I have shared them with both Susan and Linda. I've gotten no comments back. Um, House Council is asking for a formal vote tonight of the board, uh, particularly since we do not have any senatorial representation. We need to get this through the Senate Council as well. So we could go through the formality of, of adopting these changes as suggested by House of Representatives Council. That would be fine. I make a motion to approve the two uh, draft resolutions for the treasurer and collector. Second. Okay. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And how about <laughs> Before we go into um, executive session, is there anything else on anybody's agenda? We have some people in the audience. Can we help you? Uh, we're with Happy Valley Comedy for the entertainment license approval. Oh, we did that already. I mean, that was yeah. like at 7 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you said you were coming back to it. Okay. No. <laughs> I'm sorry. There's the comedy for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have it right here at Town Hall. So, uh, so just contingent on teams. the building inspector and the fire chief. And the fire chief is right behind yeah. you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so right. that little check in with him was <laughs> it. That was it. Yeah. Great. You don't have to come and do that. I'm and sorry for that. That's okay. Pardon? When is Tim back? Another week or so. Monday? Monday next, or next later? Monday, I think. Monday or later. I think it's next. I thought I it was like Tuesday. Wasn't it like yeah, the 19th yeah, or something? I think it was about 22nd. 22nd. I can go to his office and look. That's two hours you've ever spent, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> so much fodder. So much fodder. We dedicate our first show to you. <laughs> Tune in. It will be live for you. Now you know that to you can finish the top of Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry about that. Before you go. All right. So we have any announcements this evening? Yes, we have 12 to 8 polls open tomorrow. 12 to 8, June 21st. And again, to remind people, this is the vote um, to say yay or nay to the additional funding that was approved at town meeting for the North Hadley fire substation. Sounds great. Also, uh, the Citizens Police Academy is ongoing right now. I don't know if Chief Mason knows more about it than I do. Maybe you can just say something real quick. I know it goes from this Thursday on for seven more weeks. Uh, I believe it's, it's six seven weeks? more weeks yeah. because over the total of eight, we had our first uh, class last week. There's still some spots left open. Uh, if you want to, anybody wants to uh, um, join, um, you can give me a call, send me an email, um, and we will uh, we'll take care of the rest. We'll reach out to you with whatever paperwork is necessary. Uh, congratulations to the boys uh, baseball team at Hopkins Academy on their Division Four Western Mass Champs. <coughs> and uh, sorry for your loss last night to Oxford. You did uh, win against St. Mary's going into the States. Um, and uh, we had a great year and look forward to next year uh, being as good. Thank you very much. 
And also a thank you to the girls varsity softball for making tournament this year, the uh, first time in seven years and going to a tournament game. So congratulations to them also. Uh, and then I have one condolences to Myron Chudzik and his family for the loss of Mary Ann uh, Chudzik. Um, it was his wife and our condolences from the select board. Um, I have to say my first encounter with Marianne, I did tell Myron as I was an 18 year old nurse um, at Cooley Dickinson, so you know that's many years ago. Um, and she was a <laughs> night nurse. And so Marianne had, uh, gave a very colorful um, report in the morning about how her night went. And uh, it kind of just made the day go better. And she was a great nurse and um, mom and cook and uh, member of the community, so our, our condolences to Myron and his family. Thank you. And now I will entertain to go into executive session. Can we do an all three? <clears throat> one motion for all three? That would be wonderful. Okay. All right, I will make a motion that we go into executive session um, for the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting would have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body, and the chair so declares. Um, we have three executive session issues. Um, land court number 2018, miscellaneous case number 190. Um, that's related to the legion. <laughs> the ex also contract negotiations, um, specifically uh, with non-union non-union personnel, the chief of police, and also an executive session uh, to discuss collective bargaining, Department of Public Works, Sewer Division. Uh, as chair, I so declare that this would be a detriment to uh, discuss these things in open session, so we will go into executive session. Is there a second? Second. We'll call vote. Ms. Kevitz? Aye. Phil? Aye. Kagan? Yes. Stanley? Aye. And Trundle? Yes. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. See you on July 11th. Happy July 4th.